Welcome to the T2 Hubcast. Join Martin, Dave, Spencer and guests as they discuss all things personal and professional development. The T2 Hubcast, brought to you by the People Performance People. So welcome to the T2 Hubcast with me, Martin Johnson. And me, Victoria Garrett. V. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Are you nervous? A little bit. Cool. So, Victoria Garrett is the brand spanking new T2 consultant. How long have you been here now, V? Uh, since the 1st of June, wasn't it? So 1st of June. Best part of a month. A month already. And she's still here, which means it's a good sign, right? Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> So, Victoria, welcome to Team T2, first of all. Um, I think this is, well, this is your first podcast, so it's a great way to introduce you to our listeners and our customers. Um, And you'll be appearing a lot more on the podcast going forward. So, you know, it's nice to have, I'd say, first of all, it's nice to have a new consultant in with new experience, but it's also nice to have a female consultant in because we're quite male heavy, aren't we, on the consulting team? And it's just nice to have that completely different approach. Yeah. So uh, I'm excited for this podcast. We haven't really got topics that we're going to talk about. What I want to use the time for is to welcome you, introduce you and a bit of your background. We'll talk a bit about L&D in general, a bit about leadership and just see where yeah. we go. We'll freestyle it. Is that all right yeah. with you? Yeah, let's do it. So V, give us a bit of an insight into you. The last 15, you've been in L&D 15 years, right? Yeah, just shy of, yeah. So give us a bit of um, potted history to you. Um and then we can, uh, and, and sort of why you wanted to join T2. Uh, and a month in, I guess the other question is, is a month in, is is the reality matching what you initially thought was was going to, T2 was going to be all about? Excellent. Okay, well, I've had two careers, really. Uh, the first one for about 29, 30 years was in musical theatre, so which, which actually is applicable because it very much comes into my style of delivery as well when I'm training. Um, but then I decided to get a proper job like you do when you're in the industry. And I decided to go back to university and train randomly in podiatry. Wow. Yeah, completely different. There was a theory behind it, but I won't bore you with that now. (laughs) Um, But I got to the end of my degree. I was very successful in my degree and I was offered a doctorate off the back of it, which I was very lucky to to get. But sadly, at the time, I wasn't in a position to take up the doctorate. But fortunately for me, this is where I got into L&D. The university decided to employ me instead as a clinical lecturer. And that started my sort of L&D journey. So I started working with students in the clinics, doing a bit of research, things like that. And that led me, one, two, three, to working at the Department of Health, no less, implementing a strategy across the NHS, um, a new product that they were launching at the time. Um, Once the product was launched, it was then my role to look at the training and the quality behind the actual implementation of the product. Is it working? And again, that brought me back into training, learning. And I sort of stayed in the NHS in an L&D capacity across three or four different roles for about five or six years. I then became a consultant, also trained as a coach, an executive business coach in that time as well, and became more of a consultant. And I was working then across like public, private, charitable sectors with individuals, groups, a real wide, diverse sort of selection of of people, um, which gave me really good sort of experience and grounding in in coaching and how it sort of then fed into leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward, I became a business manager um, for a national training organization. and then moved back to Hull, my hometown, um, and got a job at the council um, and working across the, well, with council staff, but also at Hull University as well, specifically in leadership and management programs. So it was kind of like a culmination of all that experience resulted in my last role at the council, which is basically what I bring here to T2, mm. all that kind of rich, diverse kind of experience. Yeah, and I do observe that in you. You have, and one of the reasons, obviously, when when you came through the process with us that we jumped at the opportunity to hire you was because you have the ability, and, and if you think about that background that you've just described, you have the ability to both engage, and, and I mean this in the right way, engage and entertain, which is the performing arts background. Yeah, You're very good on your feet. You're very good with your nonverbal communication, your body language, your presence. Um, you like to try different methods, yeah. which we'll come on to. You like to you know, put different methodologies into your training process that makes it more interactive and engaging. And that all comes from that performing arts background, doesn't it? It does. Um, but then you've got the, the, the experience and the knowledge from that clinical lecturing and that NHS background and that working in the public sector. And 
So, and then obviously the leadership experience with the council. So it's like it all came into the melting pot and it's everything we look for. Yeah. Because for me, we have this saying at T2, which is, and anybody who's worked with us will probably vouch for this. Content is important, incredibly important, but delivery is everything. Yeah. The ability to engage an audience, engage a group of people and get them to go, this is all right, I'm going to give it a go, is everything because then the content falls into place. Yeah. So that was what I, for what it's worth, really sort of spotted in you straight away. To, yeah. to use that skill set, I think, was was a really good combination. Yeah. So so four weeks in, Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons you wanted to join T2 is because you'd experienced T2 yourself. You'd yes. been to some of my sessions. You'd yes. been to a couple of HR execs, et cetera. Yeah. And I think you described it as you thought, that's where I want to be. That's the type of thing I want to do. That makes sense. Absolutely. I, yeah, cross paths with you. I think it was about two years ago, as you say, a HR execs event. And just knew straight away, I just thought there's just something about, I just got a gut feeling there's something about T2 and me that just kind of is a match. Yeah, you tapped um, me up, didn't you, for a I, job straight away? Yeah, I like did. Five minutes after meeting me, she <laughs> took me in a room to one side and went, listen, if you're ever hiring, I'm interested. <laughs> like, this I'm is put, true. I'm putting my flag in the sand right now. I remember that, yeah. Absolutely. And then stalked you for two years yeah, thereafter, yeah. yeah. Any jobs yet? Any jobs yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is true. I, I'm not, you know... I'll admit it. Um, yeah, because I honestly sort of put put a sort of, you know, a sort of line in the sand. I was just like, that is what I'm working towards because there's just something about your ethos here, how you do things um, that just resonated with me. And and it was really refreshing as well um, because you're really focusing on, on really sort of uh, light bulb moments or penny drop moments that really deliver like lifelong change yeah um as opposed to focusing on sort of skills for the workplace and frameworks which, and, and, frameworks and yeah. sort of yeah it, it felt freer it felt more liberating yeah. but actually really making a difference who are you so if you've got 10 people in a room we don't want to say right here's a leadership framework and you all have to be a leader like this because that's ridiculous right what we yeah. want to say is there's 10 people in this room let's lift the lid on who you all are then encourage you to be your authentic self and then give you some tools that you can pull into your repertoire to be able to take the right step in the right direction when it's going to serve you well. And that is the secret to our success. Nobody comes and gets morphed into some robot leader or gets trained in one methodology. It's like, let, let's let uncover who you are, allow you to be you, but give you the tools to be the better version of you. And that yeah. is, if, if that makes sense, that's what we do isn't it it is so yeah. is it a reality four weeks in it's and great it's everything I thought it would be good it's absolutely brilliant loving it We've got a lovely team everybody's been incredibly welcoming um yeah just loving the energy and the pace um it's lovely to be back in the office as well and not yeah. be working from home which I did for 14 months yeah everything about it is what I hoped so. well you haven't hit the trough yet so maybe I'll, I'll ask you in three months time <laughs> when you're snowed under with work yeah. and you're like I can't cope <laughs> yeah well it's lovely to have you V I've been incredibly impressed with your start you're already delivering you're already taking your own clients on it really is good to see and I think you're going to be wonderfully successful here for what it's worth thank you so um <clears throat> let's move it forward learning and development then you've been in it yeah. 15 years you've yeah. seen the good the bad the ugly we, if we're all honest, as consultants and trainers, we've all delivered exceptional experiences. We've all had an off day and gone, that's not gone too well. We've all tried things that have flopped. We've tried things that have failed. We've been in sessions ourselves that have been rubbish, that we've switched off really early. And we've been in sessions ourselves that have inspired us. So if you was to try and encapsulate over your experience this, what makes a good... So get, is there any examples of what makes great learning and development experiences versus what doesn't if that makes sense well I don't think as human beings we change the way we learn I think I think research suggests that as well that we still learn as we did as a child but if you think about how we learn through play as a child and then suddenly we get to school and then we get to university and it all becomes very Serious. standing behind the lectern and, and, yeah. and deliver, which only actually meets one learning style yeah so we're kind of discluding probably 75 percent of our audience there and and what I've always been really keen to do and is to mix it up and to always be very creative in my sessions and facilitate those sessions through play to some extent so for example one of the things I love to do is if you were to see me in a face-to-face -face session obviously pre-covid sadly I need to find a way of doing it now um is I'd give everybody fidget toys and we'd all sit there playing with toys and because actually at that point once we're fiddling playing research shows that we're actually the brain is engaging more and we're taking on board more learning information people think you're a bit crazy at the start but then once you've got this kind of whole vibe going in the room and people are playing with toys and things it's just they're taking in more and they're enjoying the session and they remember it and that's how I like to approach 
to approach my lessons. So I was always kind of renowned in every environment I've worked in. I've kind of like been the weird one that does the weird <laughs> lessons. But people walk, used to walk past the door and like sort of like walk past the glass door and then walk, you know, step back and go, what is she doing in there? Yeah. But we're having fun. And, and that is where people, how people learn, in my experience, too much time is spent talking to an audience and um, teaching them I like to facilitate and I actually really like to encourage peer on peer learning as well um, so facilitating that opportunity for everyone to learn from each other because the expertise is always in the room you're in there to facilitate that in my experience yeah experiential learning as well is really key to make sure that people have a, a really sort of a key understanding so they can have like concrete experience of a situation they can then reflect on it conceptualize it and then say so then how does it play out in the workplace so they really experience what that thing is rather than just telling them what that thing is so yes it's about teaching skills yes it's about developing knowledge but it's about saying this is the theory behind it let's have a go now how does that apply what's the practical application that you can take from that session i think if we can do that we're appealing to the different learning styles and you, you're much more likely to engage a larger audience that that resonate with something. And that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Maybe everyone will resonate with something different, but we're just trying to make that group resonate with something they can take away that's tangible. Do you think it's a fine line? I love it, by the way. I love the creativity. I can all, already tell some of the th th plans you have and some of the things you're going to implement into the way we do things here at T2, which will be, which will be fascinating and great. Do you think it's a fine line? And this is an honest question between adding that playfulness in and getting people involved and interacting and doing stuff be between doing that effectively and it being fun and engaging and crossing the line where people start to feel it's tedious and uncomfortable. And, you know, like sometimes people go, oh, it's not one of them days, is it, where we're going to be trust catch catching each other and, you know, and, and all the rest of it. And I think, and it, different personalities are different because some people love the play element. Some people feel uncomfortable with it. Oh, you get me to stand up in front of the group already and do this. What's your thoughts on that? Do you think it's about judgment and about reading the room mm -hmm. and it's a fine line and you can either get it really right or it can become a little bit like, you know, I'm back at school again? Or generally in your experience, do you think most people warm up after five minutes? Exactly that. I was going to say it's always a choice. Nobody has to engage. I love seeing people's faces when they walk into a room and think, what is all of this? This is weird. This is going to be weird. And they sit there and, and, and generally for like the first 20 minutes, half an hour, nobody's touched anything. You know, everyone's a little bit like, I'm not going first. By the end of the session, everyone's playing with every, you know, people have warmed up into it and they, and they sort of see the fun element behind it. But if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Not, you know, nothing's, nothing's mandatory. It's just an option. And when you explain why they're there and what the context is behind it, people kind of get it. And then it's kind of, like, and I do think, I mean, I had a session I did at the council um, and I, I must have taken, I don't know, let's say I took 15 different things for people to play with um during the session and by the end of it i think i had one left everyone was saying do you mind if i take this home because actually <laughs> and when we're doing something that makes people at times feel a little bit uncomfortable it's a good way of kind of like quashing any anxiety as well because they've got something to sort of play with as well so it works on numerous different levels from uh in, in, in different ways it engages people but if you don't want to do it you don't have to do it it's just part of the fun and i feel as though you know and, and the feedback i've had has been that people really remember it because it's different as well yeah. and we go there and and we're not you know sort of ashamed to, to to sort of mix it up a bit i quite like the fact that we're building a team here at t2 of consultants we where we're all quite different in delivery yeah and therefore it allows us to read a particular audience a client or a sector or a level of leadership or whatever and go right that's going to fit really well with victoria or that's going to fit really well with spencer's style or dave that's got you written all over it or actually that needs to be me you know yeah um and and that's what i'm observing like you know, you are going to bring, I think, that creative element to train into T2. Now, we have a creative element, me, Dave, and Spence, but I don't think it's anywhere near the scale of yours, right? <laughs> so I think you're going to bring that. I'm a storyteller. I'm a freestyling storyteller. So it's like engage the audience, high impact, high energy. It's about setting the scene on, you know, the science behind what we do in the content, but I bail out of my slides almost instantly and I'm just in the room with the people and we're naturally engaging them, you know, and and that really works for me. That That's yeah. sort of my style. Spencer's very much a, a systematic with his approach. You know, he's got, a, he's got an approach and an agenda for the day and he wants to cover it and he will cover it exceptionally well. His high energy is, is very good when he's transmitting around knowledge and impact. Um, and, and Dave's like quite a mixture of, I think, all all of us. You know, he's got that transmit element. He's got that storytelling element. He doesn't mind doing the breakouts and the thingy. So he tends to, 
naturally do that. But we've all got we've all got our own style, and I think you you just brought something a little bit extra, a little bit different to us three. Yeah. Which is really was the intention because if we just brought in the same type, yeah. it yeah. would be great for scaling. Yeah. But I think you've just given us that extra bit of an option where you go, no, that this this really needs this, and that would sit really well with Victoria. And I think you will be good across all clients, but you look at some of the industries where you really need that engaging element. Some of the industries where they come to us and they just, if anything, as well as the education, they need some time out. They need to get the brain, like, you know, NHS workers who are under immense mm-hmm. pressure and stress, fire service under immense pressure and stress, stress police force, any any of those charity sectors who are struggling right now, mm. you know, I see them as when they come to us, they do want that element mm. of release. Yeah. They want to just have a good time and go, I needed that. Yes. And I think we're already seeing that when we're starting to position you in some of those engagements, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, don't get me wrong. I can, I can turn it up and turn it down. Do you know what I mean? It's not, it doesn't have to be like that. You can, you know, I'm flexible enough to tailor my style. If it's not appropriate and applicable, obviously I wouldn't do it, but they're the kind of tools I have in my toolkit that, if I'm free to use, you know, whatever skills I, I want to use, then that's where I'd love to take it. But what you're do you, what right. do you think about execs? So yep. is, is it the higher up the chain you go? So working with, I can imagine working with supervisors and mid-managers, they throw themselves into that because they haven't had a great deal of development. You know, this, they're, still, they're still on that career journey where they're trying to learn and develop and move up the chain. Mm-hmm. What about when you get to, so I do a lot of work with boards and directors mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and stuff like that, corporations and organizations. When you get up there, do you find them being a bit more reluctant to engage or actually are they just as human as everybody else and they want to? I think they're just as human, Martin. I really do. Um, they're more likely to think, what is this? <laughs> a bunch of execs. But in my experience, it's not been any different. Um, yeah, you're going to turn it down a little bit probably. Feel, you know, feel the room a little bit more before you go in there. But no, I don't think they're any different. Do you think, so? I guess we talked about, me and Dave talked about this before, and let's let's sort of go into this right now. Um, it's universally relevant in any, when you're working with any group of people that as a consultant or a trainer or a facilitator or whatever your role is on the day, you have approximately two minutes to win hearts and minds. Mm-hmm. The very first two minutes of the day from the moment they walk in, mm-hmm. like we talk about in the chimp theory and in yeah. human, basic human functions, they look at you. Mm-hmm. They look at how you look, how you dress, how you carry yourself, how you speak, how you engage them, how you greet them. Mm-hmm. They look at the board, mm-hmm. the props, the apparatus, the room, yeah. and they've gone, I like you or not, before yeah. you've even said a word. Yeah. Us at the, the, the way we start a session, the way we are ready to rock and greet people is everything because mm-hmm. that then gives you, that earns you the right. Mm-hmm. To sort of get them into the session early, doesn't it? Whereas Absolutely. if you if you if you're playing around with your bloody laptop and you're still not ready and you you don't greet them properly and you look a bit oh, nervous, yeah. they're gonna go. Yep, oh, I'm not for this today. Yep. So do you Absolutely. agree with that? Do you know yep. is the first couple of minutes really important? And if so, how do you try and attack that first few minutes? Is it about engaging them as soon as they're in the room? Yep. humanizing yourself, all of that great stuff. All of that, yeah. Building rapport from the moment you cross paths, yeah. Finding some common language, finding, you know, some something to converse with, to make them feel relaxed so that they feel like this is not going to be a, you know, because again, you you walk into a training room and you don't quite know what you're walking into, do you? You don't know what, what you're going to be challenged to do. So there might be some anxiety, some nerves. You might be meeting new colleagues. Um, it might be a subject matter that, that is a bit daunting. Let's say you're walking into, a, you know, speaking and presenting workshop. You know, a lot of people would walk in completely <laughs> daunted wouldn't they say it's just putting people you know at ease straight away and just building rapport with them like you say and uh, making them feel relaxed making sure they've got a drink um, and just yeah just catering for them and to them and making sure that they they feel like a guest almost in your space and that they're looked after do you get nervous still before sessions absolutely yeah, yeah. I'm glad you said that because yeah. I do and people yeah. say Martin how do you do what you do for a living you're the most confident man on the planet and I'm like <laughs> well it might look like that from the outside but the minute the minute in this profession your nerves go you lose your edge. Absolutely. Because for me, your nerves say, this is so important, switch on. And yeah. and that's where you channel those nerves to be in that performance zone so you can give them the best possible experience. Absolutely, I don't think you yeah. could do that without the nerves. No. You know? I think if I lost the nerves, I think I would probably change career. Yeah. I think it's the driving you won't get force. The fu- because of the nerves at the start, it, the fulfillment at the end is great. Absolutely, yeah. It yeah. wouldn't be that without the nerves, right? And yeah, and you wouldn't. There wouldn't be the same quality. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't perform to the same quality in that space because there's nothing. 
you know it's you're on autopilot you know it's just a monologue that you're just repeating time and time again there's nothing in it and then if you're not inspiring people then quit you know we're there to inspire we're there to deliver a message we're there to you know um take people to the next sort of like push them you know out of their slightly out of their comfort zone so that really like in that growth zone you know where they're really moving forward if we can't do that anymore and we're not passionate about that then for me it's game over really and to to push other people into that what we call state of arousal in the flow state theory or on the outside their comfort zone so they can learn and develop. We've got to be outside ours too. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we've yeah. all got to be there together, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, another question. Uh, you've observed a few things I've done yes. recently. You know, I'm a sort of a law above myself when it comes to learning and development. I have been known to swear. Um, you know, I get incredibly passionate Um there's a healthier level of challenge in there, but it's completely authentic. It's yeah. like I'm in that state of flow where I don't know what's going to happen and how it's going to happen, but it's usually good. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you stand on that? Was you quite surprised and taken back by that when you first observed it? And do you think your style is slightly different where you would mind your P's and Q's a little bit and try and be a bit more <laughs> professional or whatever? Because I guess, you know, when people book with Claire with me and we go, right, you can have mine. Yeah, but let, just a couple of caveats. You know, if, if, <laughs> if swearing's a no-go, let's not book him. And if you don't want to be challenged as much, you know, maybe he's not for you, et cetera. So, yeah. you know, what was your, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think each to their own, but for you personally, you try and stay a little bit more composed, a little bit more professional, a little bit more, all that type of stuff? Well, as you say, we're all quite unique, aren't we? We're all quite yeah. different. For you and your style and your approach, it absolutely sits and and it works and you know you are you know to watch you deliver training you know <laughs> not just saying this because you're my boss but you know it is like watching the master at work do you know what I mean you are yeah. so engaged and you just you sort of hang off your every word it's you're just so easy to listen to for me I, I suppose I have a slightly softer style yeah. in that yeah I've kind of worked in environments where I've probably had to watch my p's and q's um so it's kind of just natural to me to do that it wouldn't feel natural to just throw in a swear word and I don't even know if it would sit as part of my personality I don't even know if that's who I am so yeah it's I, I'm not against it we're just very different you don't listen to the thing you just mentioned it that you don't generally swear generally no I don't right and, and I'm a little bit counselor state I always have been and but it's part of my authenticity yeah. and I don't do it to be provocative or because look at me I'm swearing I do it because I get lost in a in a story or in a moment where if I was telling that down the pub that's exactly how I tell it yeah so why did you know so it, it feels so it allows me to be authentic and I actually think it's authentic to the audience then as well because they go he's right do you know what I mean yeah. and it's not offensive stuff no, but it's like no. I'll tell a story about if someone in a meeting says x to you and you think well piss off you know yeah, or yeah. I don't give a shit or whatever and, it, and it's all in the right context and people go I resonate with that because that's exactly yeah. how I feel right yeah yeah and and you're very much you because you wouldn't walk around the office effing, effing and Jeff and you yeah. do have that nice way about you etc um but again that's authentic to you yeah that's right and I think with yourself it you can actually you can so tell it's coming from a place of passion mm. you know when you're in that moment you're effing, you know you're effing and Jeff and it's coming from you know it's you're not just standing there doing it you know it's part of your story it's part of your act so it kind of fits and actually there's some of the sessions I've sat through you've kind of given other people the sort of um you've opened the door for other people to sort of say that back to you and yeah. and, and you give them permission and I think sometimes people like that as well because ultimately there are times where you just do want to say that person was just you know yeah um so you give people permission yeah. to do that. So in some your people, situation it, it works for you without a doubt sometimes people just want to say well, I've been told this about leadership all my life. And yeah, quite frankly, it's bollocks. Yeah. And, and it's quite refreshing in front of their peer group for yeah. them to be able to say that without thinking, oh, I can't say that in this training environment in case it comes back on me, you know. So yeah. I do like to try and draw out a bit of honesty. But then you've got to caveat that with it, with the positives of, okay, so what can we do about it? And, and yeah. how can we really go forward and make a difference? Yeah. Let's yeah. just come on to leadership. So you mentioned, yes. you know, I want to spend the last five or six minutes on leadership. So you mentioned you've done a little bit of, of work on leadership, or a lot of work on leadership. But, yeah. we, we, you know, leadership is, there's millions of topics around leadership that yes. we focus on. And leadership's a big, broad topic, and there's many facets of leadership. But yeah. one of the things we're talking about a lot at the minute is post-COVID leadership. Has yes. it changed is it different? Do all do we chuck out all what we've learned before and start again? Or actually, is that all that applicable? But we just need to be mindful of what's different. Yeah. What's your experience of that right now? I think what you've just said there, I think um, exactly the last part you made, you, you point you said about everything is still applicable. 
but the landscape has changed so dramatically that I think what was working pre-COVID may not be working so well post-COVID. And I think as a leader now, it's all about having you know, empathy, massive levels of empathy, um, flexibility, some of these things, listening skills, you know, greater levels of awareness. You know, we're asking leaders now to to manage a team that probably feels very disjointed. You've probably got blended, you've got some staff blended doing part from home, part in the office, some that are completely at home, some that are in the office full time. But to bring that team together in the same way that that would, you know, pre-COVID was everybody in an office, it's incredibly difficult, I think, for leaders. Um, and that's where I'm sort of hearing on the grapevine that some leaders are starting to struggle. So I think it's naturally shifted the culture um, in organisations. And I think leaders are still trying to find their feet in what is this new modern workplace and with this new more modern workforce and and I think some of the old rules rules no longer apply I think there's a bit of a hangover from sort of presenteeism in terms of you know how many hours spent in the office was a marker of success as to how much commitment has been given we can't do that anymore I think you you're right and here's my view on it I think for years we've been teaching leadership to organizations around moving them from the traditional hierarchical metric driven results driven at all costs style to you've got to look after your people as well you've got to be empathetic you've got to get to know people you've got to engage them mobilize them motivate them and i think what's happened in the pandemic and i think there's a middle ground Mm -hmm. i think great leadership is when a leader balances empathy compassion and the human element of building teams Mm -hmm. with very clear and firm ability to drive results and performance. That can't go away. Yes. What I've seen in the pandemic is three things have happened. Organizations have gone whole empathy and compassion at the cost of results. Yeah. So so productivity has dropped off. Yeah. Some have gone, they've absolutely got scared and gone, you need to deliver and what are you doing at home? And I want you to send me an email about everything you're doing. And they've just lost their people yes. because they haven't shown compassion. Yep. And I think in that middle chasm, of the ability to go, I'm going to give you complete flexibility, trust, empowerment. I'm going to be empathetic. We're going to work through this. But make no bones about it. You're still here to do a job. And I need you to do that job. Yes. In that middle ground is where organizations are performing. And it's where we've been trying to get them to for years. Yeah, yeah. So I think the pandemic has thrust organizations to be more empathetic and compassionate. Mm -hmm. Some are not getting it right. Mm-hmm. Some have gone too far and they've seen a drop off in performance because it's complete imp- and 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 they've almost lost the confidence to say, you need to do this work. You need to be held to account. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. In the middle ground. And, and what we find is if you are compassionate and empathetic and you trust and you empower and you're flexible, you will deliver the performance for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't need to do anything. You will you will go above and beyond to repay me. Yeah. And yeah. that's generally happening in organizations who are being very crystal clear on the accountability. We've still got yeah. a job to do. Yeah. But how you do that, where you yes. do that from, I'm going to give you complete flexibility. Yeah. It's about accomplishments, not activities now. Yeah. Um, however you get from point A to point B outputs. is down to you. Yeah. Outcomes and outputs, not inputs. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But I do think it is a good time just to kind of go back to the drawing board and just clarify your position in terms of how clear am I with with the message to my staff? Do they know what they're doing? I know from 14 months at home myself, you feel so disjointed. You Mm. think, am I the only person working for the council right now? I don't talk to anybody. What am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? What's everybody else doing? So being clear on sort of goals and roles and what does that look like? Being clear in terms of your hard and soft communication styles and then making sure that you've got that connection as well. Um, How are you bringing that team together? How do they still feel like a team when they're all completely disjointed? It's a real challenge for a leader, but I think that's that for me is the focus. And some simple sort of coaching questions as well, asking your staff each week, you know, what is it you're working on? When do you think you'll have achieved that by? Do you need any help? Where, where can I support you? Is probably all a leader needs to do just to keep that regular check in and make sure that people are, are working towards they should be without micromanaging, making them feel guilty for stepping away from the laptop for five minutes to go and get a shower mm. at two o'clock in the afternoon and all this, you know, weird and wonderful ways of working that we're now in. Um, awesome. Yeah. Victoria, that is 29 minutes up and it's gone in the blink of an eye. It has. Uh, awesome first podcast. I could talk to you all day about this stuff. There will be more. Don't worry. We'll come back and we'll we'll get stuck into all sorts of topics. Welcome to the team. Thank you. Uh, it's a fab first podcast. And um, yeah, I look forward to uh, returning to do more subjects soon. But um, top yeah. job. 
Thank you, Martin. Awesome. And we'll be back shortly with another T2 Hubcast. Thank you.